According to Klingon mythology, the gods created Kortar, the first Klingon male to live in the paradise of Kuitu. Feeling lonely, the gods formed him a female companion, but he grew jealous of this second being and they fought, ending with Kortar defeated. To his surprise, the female did not kill him and instead proposed an alliance as they were stronger together. Accepting her proposal, the two united as one and destroyed the gods who created them. A prominent legend repeated at weddings, the Klingon people actually originated from an advanced humanoid progenitor species living 4.5 billion years in the past, which traveled across the galaxy seeding worlds with their genetic material, resulting in the eventual evolution of Klingons, humans, Romulans, Cardassians, and thousands of others. Evolving into a large, physically powerful species with exceptional courage and a mind for battle, leadership of their people was often won in combat, and so by the 9th century, their homeworld of Kronos was ruled by the hated tyrant Molor, considered the greatest warrior among them. Inspiring fear in his enemies, the city of Kamchi was left almost entirely undefended when the garrison fled before 500 warriors sent by their cruel ruler. However, one man, the lowborn warrior Kalis, and one woman, the brave Lady Lucara, refused to run and took on the entire army alone. Despite overwhelming odds, they defeated Molar's forces and began the greatest love story in Klingon history. Leading a rebellion against their oppressor, Kalis used the first ever Batleth to kill Molor in battle at the River Skrull, a moment commemorated in a famous Klingon drinking song. Establishing the Klingon Empire, Kalis went on to defeat the armies of the Thekleri, establish a strict code of honor, and develop a robust warrior culture that dominated Klingon society for the next 1500 years. At the end of his reign, legends say Kalis left to take his place in the afterlife of Stovakor, but pointed to a specific spot in the sky before he departed, claiming it was where he would one day return. Pointing to the planet Boreth, it became home to a Klingon monastery devoted to his memory and final prophecy. Though most were happy to see an end to Molor's reign, he was nevertheless remembered as a great warrior, with some even forming the followers of Molor, remaining loyal to his memory. Nevertheless, his time was over, and so under Emperor Kalis the Unforgettable and the Imperial dynasties that followed, Kronos developed into a feudal society with power residing in the noble class, whose families comprised the great houses of the Klingon Empire. From among this aristocracy, a select few served on the High Council, led by a Chancellor, aiding the Emperor in governing his empire. Although women were greatly valued in Klingon society, viewed as equals on the battlefield, only men were traditionally chosen for the High Council, though some exceptions were made. Enamored with their identity as a warrior culture, the need for battle was a constant source of division for their people, leading great houses to war against each other, and so emperors directed their fury outward, allowing the empire to expand drastically, conquering and subjugating any who resisted. Over most of the next 1500 years, the Klingon Empire was ruled by a series of authoritarian leaders, including men like Emperor Sompak, remembered for his conquest of Tongvei, ordering the entire population massacred and city burned, Emperor Murek, who introduced blunted batleths into practice training so his warriors killed their enemies rather than each other, and Chancellor Makwa, in power during the Second Empire, when he sent a fleet of ships into Breen's space which were never heard from again. In the 14th century, the Empire was attacked and looted by the Herx species, hailing from the Gamma Quadrant, stealing many priceless treasures like the original batleth of Kalis. Recovering as best they could, it was possible the Klingons reverse-engineered Herc technology to create their warp drives, though it was believed they did not fully achieve high-speed warp travel until after the mid-20th century. For a brief time, the Empire suffered a drastic change in government when General Catrellin assassinated Emperor Reclaw and put the Imperial family to death. The next decade saw the Empire ruled by a council elected by the people, which introduced several notable reforms. However, the Dark Time, as it was later called, was soon replaced by a return to authoritarian dictatorship and the rise of a third dynasty, which took the names and titles of the last imperial family to create the illusion of an unbroken line. As the centuries went on, the role of their all-powerful emperor diminished, and by the 21st century, the position was abandoned altogether, leaving the empire in the hands of the High Council and Chancellor. Many believe the decline of their honor-bound society began with the end of imperial rule, but whatever the cause, as time passed and the empire expanded, the old traditions set forth by Kalis were ignored, seeing Klingon leaders more concerned with using politics and war to satiate their greed, sacrificing the good of the empire for individual ambitions. 
expanding greatly throughout the 22nd and 23rd centuries. The empire was considered both a beta and alpha quadrant power, conquering those near their borders while establishing relationships, both positive and negative, with more distant and substantial states. Establishing cordial relations with the Vulcan species by the 21st century, the Klingon Empire first encountered humans when a courier crashed on Earth in 2151, ending up shot by a local farmer. With Earth's allies the Vulcans negotiating a deal to prevent war, Captain Archer brought the courier to the Empire where he delivered a message encoded in his DNA that averted a civil war among the Great Houses. Throughout the years that followed, Captain Archer had several more encounters with the Klingons, feeling an ever-present hostility between their people. Matters only worsened after the formation of the United Federation of Planets, making them a competing, emerging superpower to the Klingon Empire. Between 2223 and 2256, the two rivals became locked in a tense cold war, sometimes clashing in skirmishes or minor conflicts like the Battle of Donatu V. By the end of this Cold War period, the 24 great houses of the Klingon Empire were once again divided and fighting among themselves. However, in 2256, the noble warrior Takuvma successfully gathered all the houses together in order to provoke a fight with the Federation, thereby uniting their people to conquer a common foe. Though it cost him his life, Takuvma accomplished his mission in the Battle of the Binary Stars, starting a war between the Empire and Federation. Yet their unity did not last long after his death, and their great houses again fractured, with each faction competing to do the most damage possible to their enemies. After a year of fighting, the Federation lost a third of their fleet and were on the verge of losing the war, so Starfleet authorized a secret mission to plant a hydro bomb in a volcano on Kronos to destroy the planet. Yet when the crew of the USS Discovery learned what was happening, they made a deal with the Klingon Lorel, a wise disciple of Takuvma, giving her the detonator which she used as leverage against the High Council to be chosen Chancellor and make peace with the Federation. A decade after making peace, war once again loomed when the Klingons demanded the Federation withdraw from a number of planets near their border. Yet war was averted by the Organians, powerful non-corporeal beings who negotiated the Treaty of Organia, establishing a border and neutral zone. Tensions then further relaxed when the Empire gave up their claim to the Arcanus Sector, ceding it to the Federation in 2272. Even so, relations remained poor over the ensuing years, making war inevitable, if not for a terrible tragedy in 2293 when overmining destroyed the Klingon Moon of Praxis. This catastrophe forced the Empire to divert significant resources to deal with the environmental aftermath, leaving them little choice but to participate in formal negotiations with the Federation, resulting in the Kittimer Accords, establishing long-term peace between them. However, while no longer on the verge of war, relations did not truly improve until an incident involving another neighboring superpower. Though dealings with the Romulan Star Empire were always tumultuous, for a time they were on good terms until 2344 when Romulans invaded the Klingon outpost of Narendra III. Rushing to the defense of the Klingons, the USS Enterprise-C was destroyed when they refused to retreat against four Romulan warbirds. Witnessing the bravery and honor of this Federation ship, the Empire saw them in a new light, providing a great step forward towards a closer relationship. By the mid-24th century, the Klingon Empire and United Federation of Planets signed the Treaty of Alliance, establishing an official state of friendship and cooperation between them. This alliance created a fundamental shift in the balance of power for the Alpha and Beta Quadrants, meaning other great powers, like the Romulan Star Empire and Cardassian Union, would now have to face both the Federation and Klingons should they step out of line. This treaty established many years of peace in the region, however without an outside enemy to fight, the Klingon houses fell into their old pattern turning against each other. Although the treaty with the Federation made the Klingon Empire one of the two greatest powers in the Alpha and Beta Quadrants, peace did not provide a warrior species with much opportunity for glory, and so some were against the Treaty of Alliance, wishing a return to their conquering ways. Believing that the Romulan Star Empire would make better allies because they were both imperialist, expansionary powers, the ancient and influential House of Duras made a secret agreement to undermine their treaty with the Federation. This relationship between the House of Duras and Romulans began with the traitor Gerard, who helped them bomb a Klingon outpost on Kittimer, killing 4,000 colonists in 2346. Years later, when the High Council learned the truth about what happened, the House of Duras were far too politically powerful to punish, and so they blamed the warrior Moog, who died in the attack, as his house was no more and was unlikely to have defenders. 
Incorrect in this assumption, the Federation officer Worf, son of Moog, presented evidence of his father's innocence, but when he learned the unity of the Empire was at stake, selflessly agreed to accept discommendation as the last of their house. The longest-serving chancellor in their history, Kim Peck, kept the great houses at peace, an empire prosperous, but as he grew older, new political factions emerged, positioning themselves to challenge for leadership when he passed. Representing the old houses and establishment powers was Duras, son of Jarod, while his opponent, Gauron, was an outsider challenging the old corrupt establishment, drawing support from lesser houses and portions of the military. In 2367, Kim Peck learned he was dying from poisoning and sent for the famous Federation diplomat Jean-Luc Picard, asking him to serve as Arbiter of Succession, overseeing the ceremony where rival factions sent their champions to fight a duel to the death for leadership of the Empire. However, Picard was really summoned to investigate the Chancellor's death, as the use of poison was considered dishonorable and thus the man responsible could not become Chancellor. Throughout the investigation, they learned Duras was secretly working with the Romulans like his father, but before he could be held responsible, he was killed by Worf in an act of vengeance for the murder of his romantic partner. With Duras dead, his sisters Lursa and Bator now led their house, possessing more support than Gauron from within the Empire, in addition to continuing their family's relationship with the Romulan Star Empire, who supplied them from the outside. With their power growing, Lursa and Bator presented Toral, the illegitimate son of Duras, as a candidate to become Chancellor. However, Picard denied the request, as Toral was young and had no victories in battle or qualifications. Withdrawing from the council in protest, the House of Duras began a devastating civil war they were poised to win. Though Gauron gained the support of Worf's secret brother Kern, who brought four squadrons of loyal warriors, they remained badly outnumbered and lost three engagements in a row. Unwilling to get directly involved in the conflict, Picard nevertheless wanted to help Gauron's faction in some way and so convinced the Federation to blockade the Romulan border, preventing them from sending reinforcements to support the House of Duras. A trap then exposed this secret alliance and the House of Duras quickly lost support, allowing Gauron's forces to claim victory. Emerging as the uncontested Chancellor of the Empire, Gauron reaffirmed their alliance with the Federation, restoring the balance of power in the region. In 2369, clerics at the temple on Boreth created a clone of Kalis, given memories from their histories and legends. This man, who stood as a living tribute to the original Kalis, was given the ceremonial position of Emperor, though true power remained with the Chancellor. In this same year, the Federation discovered the Bajoran wormhole, providing instant travel to a location in the Gamma Quadrant 70,000 light-years away. Though this provided many unique opportunities, they soon encountered the Dominion, a Gamma Quadrant superpower ruled by changeling founders, obsessed with dominating what they called solid species to avoid the persecution they experienced in the past. Beginning covert operations in the Alpha Quadrant, the Dominion manipulated the Klingons into launching an unprovoked attack against the Cardassian Union. Despite their alliance, the Federation condemned these actions, leading Gauron to break off relations, pulling out of the Kittimer Accords. Hostilities then worsened when the Klingons demanded territorial concessions, leading to the brief but destructive Federation-Klingon War from 2372 to 2373. Eventually, the two powers realized the Dominion turned them against each other through a changeling infiltrator posing as General Martok, so Chancellor Gowron and Captain Benjamin Sisko of the Federation agreed to reinstate the Kittimer Accords and re-establish a defensive alliance. This alliance, later joined by the Romulans, allowed them to mount a proper defense against what became the Dominion, Cardassian, Breen invasion force. Playing a key role in the war, for a time, the Klingons fought alone, with the entire defense of the Alpha Quadrant resting on their ships, which were the only ones capable of resisting Breen energy dampening weapons. Eventually, the rest of their fleet was upgraded as well, but the prominence of the Klingons was now plain for all to see, giving much attention to the real General Martok, who escaped from a Dominion prison camp and took command of their forces. Unfortunately, this was a problem for Chancellor Gauron, who felt threatened by his general's rising popularity. Having grown corrupt and paranoid over the years, Gauron put his own selfish interests above the Empire and war effort, sending Martok on ill-fated suicide missions to discredit his name, while also taking direct control of their forces on the front lines during a time of crisis. Unwilling to allow this disgrace to continue, Worf, son of Moog, challenged and killed Gauron before making Martok the new Chancellor. With a competent leader once again commanding their warriors, Martok worked with the Federation and Romulans to push back the Dominion, eventually achieving a final victory at the Battle of Cardassia in 2375. 
Though the Klingons played a large role in saving the Alpha and Beta Quadrants, their casualties and losses were enormous, estimating they would need a decade to recover. Continuing to work and cooperate with their allies, the Klingons eventually joined the Federation by the 26th century. A special thanks to Exter for sponsoring this video. Exter provide great quality smart wallets designed with efficiency and security in mind, using premium leather and a quick card box with a trigger at the bottom for easy access to what you need. Their elegant, sleek products come with RFID protection to stop electronic pickpockets and an optional solar-powered tracker accessed through an app on your phone to ensure you never again lose your wallet. Coming in a variety of styles and colors to fit your personal wants and needs, I've been using the Napa Black Parliament wallet and am extremely pleased with the results so far. At first, I was hesitant about changing from my old, enormous George Costanza-type wallet, filled with useless cards and receipts I had no actual use for, since the Parliament is definitely a more minimalist wallet with limited room, meaning I had to get rid of most of the stuff I carried around. But to my surprise, I was thrilled with the result, realizing that I actually only use a few cards on a regular basis, and don't carry around much cash anymore, since almost everything can be paid with debit or credit cards. From my experience, I found that I can fit four embossed cards, like debit or credit cards, in the quick card box, and two more in the opening panel, while cash goes in the strap in the center. Then on the back, there's a spot for one more card, and that's where I put the awesome solar-powered tracker that will no doubt save me tons of anxiety in the future, as I tend to lose my wallet all the time. So if you're interested in checking out the great products from Exter, while at the same time supporting this channel, be sure to click on the links below, or go to shop.exter.com slash civilizationx to get a 15% discount on your purchase.